quickly, but to put our rest and trust into you, the Redeemer of each life here. Lord, we ask for your spirit to come be with us and accompany us as we learn and as we study and ponder your word this morning. In Jesus' holy name, amen. You may be seated. This morning, due to a, to a few circumstances that we couldn't really help, uh, I'm not sure what the offering will go to this Sabbath, um, but for our offering uh, that we collect, it, it will either go for church budget, and I think, does anybody remember, last Sabbath we did outdoor church at our place. Do you remember what the offering was for last Sabbath? Anybody? It's a good test. It was. It was. You're right. Thank you. So, so yes, the offering today will be for um, our Castle Rock Church budget. That's right. Thank you very much, uh, David. So we do know what our offering will go to. Every other week, it is, uh, uh, goes out of the conference. Every other week, it, it stays in uh, the local church. So today's offering will go for our, our local church budget. And the plans we have and the, the ministry and the mission we have here in our own home field in Castle Rock. Would the usher stand for prayer? Lord, as we give back to you what you have so mercifully given to us, we just ask that these means would be consecrated to your service, that they would go efficiently and swiftly into your work, that you would direct them into the paths that are the most efficient, to lead and bring others to you in this community, our own home community, and that you would lead our hearts to give as abundantly as you gave to us. In Jesus' most holy name, amen. children's offerings so don't don't worry about passing the little baskets we'll take that up next week thank you Sorry you have to see me so much up here. I'd just like to have a, a quick prayer before we begin. Lord, again I ask for you to put your words in my mouth. That this morning we might get a glimpse of truly how vast your kingdom is in that you bent all of wisdom to redeeming your fallen children here on earth. Lord, send us your spirit. Open up 
each of our hearts and minds to understand maybe just a glimpse as to what you've done in our behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Reasoning from prophecy. The book Desire of Ages on page 799 has this little phrase that caught my attention, and I believe it's in context, and you can go home and check me uh, this afternoon if you read on Desire of Ages, page 799. It says, reasoning from prophecy, Christ gave his disciples a correct idea of what he was to be in his humanity, a correct apprehension of his descent from the highest to the lowest position that can be occupied. And I believe this is in reference to his conversation he was having with his two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Do you remember the story? It was after the crucifixion. The disciples were, were feeling at their lowest point, I believe, right? And two of them were headed out of town going to Emmaus. And as they walked, what were they doing? Does anybody remember? They were what? They were recounting what happened in discouragement. They have given, given up their hope, hope, but then a stranger joins them, himself to them. And what does the Bible say? He, he started at where? He started the book of Moses, the, the books, plural, of Moses. Which books were those? Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He started there, and he expounded every prophecy concerning himself. And by the time they got to where they were going, they got it. Wow. And then the stranger acted as if he was going on, but they said, no, 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 come, 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 come. Come home with us. It's, it's almost nighttime but this statement, reasoning from prophecy, Christ gave his disciples a correct idea, which implies what? They had the wrong idea of who the Messiah was, what he came to do. He gave them a correct idea of what, was, what he was to be in his humanity, the, a correct apprehension of his descent from the highest to the lowest position that could be occupied. You know, sometimes I fear that we don't stop to think enough to thoroughly grasp these heaven re heavenly realities so much so that it really changes us. And I think that's partly the product of not studying deeply his <coughs> word on our own. You know, I, I think we all to some degree Maybe we'll have morning worship. Maybe we'll study our lesson for, uh, from the quarterly or, or study a lesson each day, maybe. But how often do we study God's word on our own time? Now, now what I mean by this is I catch myself. I study in the morning. We have morning worship. We have evening worship at our house. But outside of those set times, how often do I pick up God's word and just sit down because I've got a few minutes and I read something? Do you get what I'm saying? How often out of our routine do we pick up God's word? Do we pick up our Bibles and dig until we hit gold? How often do we just sit quietly and really ponder and think about what we've read. And it's one thing to read. We open our Bibles, we read. As soon as we're done, we close the book, we jump up, and we're headed off on the day's tasks. How much of it do we recall? Do we let sink in and just percolate down into our thoughts? This morning, I'd like to share a bit of what I have found and maybe add a couple thoughts to it. So it's kind of put things together, and I hope that it'll fuel, maybe in a little way, your own walk with Christ. And for me, this particular thought came 
One day when I was reading in Numbers 4, and if you have your Bibles, please turn there. In Numbers 4, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. So Numbers 4, and I just, I don't want to read the whole chapter, but maybe just a few verses just to kind of give you a flavor for what's going on. In verse 3 it says, from 30 years old and upward, even to 50 years old, all that enter into the host to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. So uh, let me back up. It'll make more sense. And the Lord spoke unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Take the sum of the sons of Kohath from among the sons of Levi, after their families and by their houses, the house of their fathers, from 30 years old to 50, all that enter into the host to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. So what's happening there? So the Lord is assigning of the children of Kohath within the Levites. What did the Levites do? What was their assigned job, the Levites? To care for the sanctuary. So out of that group of people, God's selecting a smaller group of people to do a special job, the sons of Kohath. Let's go on, verse 4. This shall be the service of the sons of Kohath in the tabernacle of the congregation about the most holy things. And when the camp sets forward, in other words, when they break camp, and pack things up to move. Aaron shall come and his sons, and they shall take down the covering veil and cover the ark of the testimony with it. Okay, so that, that veil that separates the holy place from the most holy place in the sanctuary, Aaron and his sons were to take that down, cover the ark of the mercy seat in the most holy place with it, and verse 6, and shall put thereon covering, oh, excuse me, I jumped. No, 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 that's right, excuse me. And shall put thereon coverings of badger skins, and shall spread over it a cloth holy of blue, and shall put it, and shall put in the staves thereof. So every article of furniture, except the candlesticks, I believe, had little round rings on the side that they could put poles through so they could carry the, the article by poles rather than manhandling it and, and touching it. So how was the Ark of the Testament covered? What did they do first? They put the veil over it, and then they put what? Badger skin. A, a badger skin, a, 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 a leather covering over it, and then what? One more. They, sp they spread a cloth of blue over it. That's interesting. And if we go on, you'll find that they did the same thing in verse 7 with the table of showbread. The table of showbread, they covered it with a cloth of blue. Then they put the utensils on it and the showbread. Then they covered it with a cloth of red. Make sure I get this right. And the same with the covering of badger skins and shall put the staves or the, the poles through the rings. So if we read on, we find that everything, all the furniture in the, uh, the temple was covered initially with a cloth of blue and then covered with leather. So, uh, you know, kind of an outer protective layer. And this got me thinking. What are the colors of the sanctuary? Those of you who have read in the Old Testament, what colors were there in the sanctuary? Anybody? Blue, purple, and red. The only other color in the sanctuary was gold. But as far as a, a, a fabric color, the colors in, the, in that sacred, well, both compartments, the... Uh, holy place and the most holy place were blue, purple, and red. And I wonder why those colors? Was it 
because God likes blue, purple, and red? Or was it that they had meaning behind it? So I started scratching my head, blue, purple, and red. Do these colors have significance in the Bible? So I started exploring. Well, the easy one is the color red. What does red symbolize? How do you know? You said blood. Okay, let's go to some references. If you turn to 2 Kings, I've got two references here. If you go to 2 Kings, chapter 3, verse 22. 2 Kings 3, verse 22. Verse 22. Actually, I start in verse 21 to kind of set the stage. It says, When all the Moabites heard that the kings were come up against them to fight, they gathered all that were able to put on armor and upward and upward and stood on the borders. Verse 22, and they rose up early in the morning, and the sun shone on the water. And the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. So what happened was the Moabites were coming against God's people, the Israelites. They amassed a vast army. They got up early in the morning, and in the morning they looked out towards the camp of the Israelites, and there was water between them. And what did it say the water looked like to them? It looked like blood, which is red like blood. So they thought, whoa. They've, th there's been a battle, all the Israelites are dead. So they just ran forward to collect all the, uh, the booty, the, the, what do we call it? Spoils. The spoils of battle, um, but they got a surprise. It says that as they came to the Israelite camp, Israel rose up and smote them all the way back to their home country and completely routed them and destroyed them. So in that context, you we can see that there was a connection between the color and what they thought it was, was the blood. But that's, that's kind of an oblique reference. Let's, let's try another one. Let's look in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 15 to 18. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 15, starting with verse 15. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear, because your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil from your doings from before mine eyes, and cease to do evil. Learn to do, to do well and to seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless and plead for the widows. In verse 18, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. That verse 18 is playing off the verse 15 where God's saying, your hands are covered with blood. And verse 18 says, what? What? though your sins, again, represented by, by that red color, the blood, though they be terrible, I will, I will take them away and make you as white as snow. Red has always been associated with blood, and as we read through the Bible, to be more specific, it's always represented the sacrificial blood of the lamb. So think, with me, when blood is shed, that's the end of the life, isn't it? You can't step any lower than that. As a lamb or as a servant, you surrender your own plans, you surrender your will, then you surrender your life, and you're gone. That's the end. So that that color of red in the sanctuary has the significance of being what? Blood, the blood of the lamb, the blood of Christ, who gave his self as a sacrifice in behalf of us, right? Okay, let's go on. The next couple of references I think are a little more subtle. 
But let's turn to Exodus 24. Exodus 24, verses 9 and 10. Exodus 24, 9 and 10. Then went up Moses and Arab, Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 of the elders of Israel. Verse 10, and they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. So you think about that reference. What, what did they see? So they saw God's throne, but what was it that they, where's the descriptive part in this verse? They noticed the color, right? The, the, the throne wasn't described. The, the person sitting on the throne wasn't described. It was what caught their attention is the throne was on a pavement of sapphire. What color is sapphire? It's blue. Kind of a royal blue color, isn't it? Okay. So let's turn over to another reference. Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 26. Ezekiel 1, 26. says, And above the firmament that was over their heads, speaking of the seraphims, was the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the appearance of a man that uh, of a man above upon it. So in that description, what are they seeing? Seeing ab above the firmament, there is a what? A throne in the appearance of sapphire. Uses the word sapphire. And on the throne was the likeness of a man. So that's added to our description, but again, what's the same as the Exodus reference? It's that color, stands out. The pavement, the throne is of sapphire. Just that royal um, blue color. If you turn a few more pages in Ezekiel, chapter 10, Ezekiel 10, verse 1, it says, Then I looked, and behold, in the firmament, that was above the heads of the cherubim, there appeared over them, as it were, a sapphire stone, as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. Okay, so if we just take those three references right there, the, the predominant color of the throne of heaven is what? Blue. So if we could look at these colors as symbolic, What would blue represent? The throne. God's throne. The throne of supreme majesty and power. I mean, this is, this is not a throne of a country or of the world. It's the throne of the universe, isn't it? So now let's go back to the book of Numbers where we started. Numbers chapter 4. I want to read verse 13. So just go down to Numbers 4, verse 13. And they shall take away the ashes from the altar and spread a purple cloth thereon. Okay, so now we're, we're back in the, the sanctuary service. So this is where things really get interesting here and really get deep. And remember, God does nothing by accident. Everything that he does, there is very deep purposes in what he's doing. And I think he's really trying to instruct us and teach us something here. So the ashes from the sacrifice that were taken out from under the altar, they were put in a, what? Purple cloth. And then taken out and disposed of out of the camp. Well, then I ask myself, purple, hmm, purple is the intimate blend of what two colors? Red and blue, 
That was easy. So what is happening here? Think about this. You visualize this kind of Old Testament setting. The lamb is brought um, to the door of the, the courtyard. The, the priest comes. The, the person who brought the lamb go in. They put their hands. They confess their sins on that lamb, right? And then the lamb is slain. So let's think about this. Where, where were they when the condemnation and guilt was placed on that lamb? In, in that whole structure? They were in the courtyard, weren't they? Before the altar, the guilt was placed and the condemnation was made on that lamb. So the sacrifice was made. The deal was done. The lamb took the sins of the one who brought it. And afterwards, the lamb was, was consumed on the altar. But what was left of the lamb after that was taken out of the camp and to be, di and be, uh, to be disposed of. But again, how was it taken out to be disposed of? In a purple cloth. So now let's, let's put this together. Turn forward into the New Testament. And let's look at John 19. John 19, let's look at the first verse there, actually the first five verses of John 19. It says, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a what? purple robe let's go on and said hail king of the Jews and they smote him and with their hands and Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto them behold I bring him forth to you that you may know that I find no fault in him then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe and Pilate said unto them behold the man Question, where was Jesus when he was condemned? In the courtyard. He was condemned and pronounced guilty in the courtyard. The decision was made there, and then he was led out of the city to die, to be disposed of. In what? What was he wearing? He was wearing a purple robe, wasn't he? You see the connection? What happened back in the Old Testament service? God was trying to teach his people what was coming in the future. And the same thing happened to Jesus. And I think there's something very fascinating here. What did that purple robe signify at that moment? The moment of condemnation was that in reality guilt was in the heavenly courts being transferred to who? To Jesus. But not like the Romans and the Jews were thinking it was being transferred, right? The Jews who instigated this whole thing, all they could see was, huh, we got him. We finally got him. We win. We're, we're getting him out of our way. That's what they were thinking, right? I mean, they, they had just bent their will for the last three and a half years to get rid of this guy that just kept pointing out how corrupt they were. They thought it was their victory, but in reality, it was the contrite sinner who won at that moment. Because he took upon himself that guilt, didn't he? He accepted it. In Psalms 85.10, David says, Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Well, that sounds very poetic, but what does it mean? Mercy in a court of law says what? 
Give the sinner a break. Truth says what? Truth is equivalent to the law in this context. The law says what? No, you committed the crime. You're guilty. David repeats it. Righteousness and peace. Righteousness, right doing, says what? The sinner must die. Peace says what? Set him free. And in that moment that Christ was condemned and accepted the guilt of humanity, infinite majesty and power meet and intimately blend with the acquiescent humility of God giving his life a ransom for lost humility, humanity. So you've got this portrayed in the sanctuary in the form of these colors. The blue represents what? The throne, kingly power, majesty. The red represents complete surrender and sacrifice. And when you blend those two together, you get that color purple. All through the gospel, you see these, these pictures coming out where Christ, as a servant, is giving himself for somebody else. He gives his lunch away as a child. He, everything he's done, it's to surrender himself for the benefit of mankind, right? He's giving, giving, giving. But yet, many times through the New Testament or the, the, the Gospels, you see what else coming out. When he came and he purged the temple of the, the traffickers, what showed up in his bearing? By his presence, that kingly bearing flashed out and people became very afraid of him and they fled, didn't they? You see that happening on several occasions. Do you remember what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane when the mob came to arrest him? They came and he said, who are you looking for? And they said, what? Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth. And, and he said, I am he. And what happened to the people? The Bible says they fell back. His kingly bearing came out. And so you've got this, this blend of two elements that just don't seem to fit together. How can you have all the money, all the power, all the majesty of the entire universe on one side, but on the other side, you, as a servant, as a sacrifice, you've given everything up. To die and to take your blood symbolically covering your children who want to confess and forsake their sins. It's just really struck my mind is oftentimes how do we put those two together? I mean here on earth any well we have this phrase what is it? about absolute power, what? Corrupts, absolutely. See, in our human way of thinking, to coalesce power means, in human nature, to become corrupt and to be more despotic, but God's kingdom is totally the opposite of that. The more power that God has, the more he surrenders and gives himself for his created beings. And I just scratch my head and I say, oh, th this is, you've got these two things that are on opposite extremes, yet Christ embodies those two things in his whole life. And when he sacrifices himself, it's even portrayed in the sacrificial system in the combination of that royalty and that sacrifice when he gives his life and he's walked out of the city in a purple robe. And I say, wow. We're told in the book Great Controversy that the science of salvation will be studied through all eternity. The infinite mysteries of the life of Christ and what it took to save us, if we're willing, will never be fully comprehended. Isn't that wild? 
It just, it just boggles the mind. No wonder the Bible says in Jeremiah, be astonished, O heavens. And in the book Desire of Ages, chapter 4, and it invites you the next chance you get, go home and read Desire of Ages, chapter 4. It's about the uh, uh, Jesus as a, as a baby being born on this earth in Bethlehem. But there's a few quotes out of that chapter that caught my attention. It says, man knew it not, but the tidings filled heaven with rejoicing. And with a deeper and more tender interest, the holy angels, the holy beings from the world of light are drawn to earth. It just boggles their mind. The last time they saw their loved commander, he was on the throne, wasn't he? And now he is here, probably about that big, newborn baby. And the angel's just scratching their th heads, thinking, ah, how does this happen? We're also told that Satan was terrified at the idea of w what's happening here. It, w it was beyond his ability to compute. Chapter 4 of Desire, De Desire of Ages goes on. It says, human pride and self-sufficiency stand rebuked in his presence. The next, next reference, the last few sentences of that chapter, I really have to read to you. The last paragraph, actually, says, The heart of the human father yearns over his son. He looks into the face of his little child and trembles at the thought of life's perils. How many of us? have looked at our children and just shook our heads thinking, oh man, is it any wonder that any one of us survive our childhood? He longs to shield his dear one from Satan's power, to hold him back from temptation and conflict, yet to meet a bitterer conflict and a more fearful risk, God gave his only begotten son that the path of life might be made sure for our little ones. Herein is love. Wonder, O heavens, and be astonished, O earth. We will never fully understand what happened in the life of Christ. It's just going to be something that we mine deeper and deeper and deeper. And it'll still boggle our minds at the end that everything fit together. It works. Think about that. The majesty of heaven, dead, because of what you and I did. That's just, but in his life, all through his life, that blue, purple, and the red, the, the blending of deity and humanity, the God who was cut down by his own children, and yet he says what? Back in Isaiah, bring your guilt, bring your red, and I will give you my sapphire. A place as kings on my throne. Why on earth would he do that? Because it's his nature. I mean, isn't that alone mind-boggling enough? Why does he do it? Because he loves us. As his created beings, he knows we're not in this primarily because we chose to be in this. We're in this as hapless victims. We're born with that nature to rebel and reject him. We never had the choice that Satan and his angels had to see clearly right from wrong and to make the decision. So God pities us. I was reading a few days ago in the book Early Writings, back on page 226. I would invite everybody to read that if the next chance you get as well as Desire of Ages chapter 4. But uh, 
early writings, page 226. The setting of this particular story was after the, uh, the Dark Ages, the, the persecution of the 1260 years. Said Satan recognized something in that persecution of the 1260 years, and that was the church became pure in its doctrine, in its purposes, and intent. Though he took millions and millions of people to their doom, he noticed that it was the strength of those martyrs that gave power to even the weakest and most timid human being. When they saw people dying for their faith, that gave them strength. And as they accepted that strength and asked God to change their hearts, it says the timid became bold and immovable as a rock. And in their patient quietness, being led to their own deaths, they caused even their murderers to tremble. And Satan said, this isn't working. So at the end of that 1260 years, he changed his tactics. And you read about that in Revelation chapter 12, towards the end of chapter 12. What does it say that the dragon did? He went to make war with the remnant of her offspring, the children of earth. And he did it with water. He sent a flood after the woman to carry her away. If you look at history, what happened after the 1,200 years of darkness and, and persecution, the scripture started being uh, translated into the common tongue. People flocked to the church. Satan switched his tactic in it, said, okay, if you can't beat them, join them. He stopped the persecution, and then he started inviting everybody possible into the church. So now what has happened is the unconverted people have come into the church. They've brought their unregenerated hearts, their own nature, the old nature that they had out in the world. They brought that into the church. And the story goes on. They brought their traditions. They brought their opinions. They brought their translations. They, they brought all this stuff in. And the truth was essentially covered, watered down, so that it couldn't be found anymore. And that was a little over 200 years ago that we've had the time to develop this, this soup in the church of we've, we've lost this clarity and distinction of what it is to stand before God and invite all of us to think about that. The truth stood in its clearness when it was on trial, whether it was Christ or humanity. Our greatest struggle now is we're not being destroyed by being burned in the town square, are we? We're being destroyed by what? The internet, the TV, the refrigerator. Sorry, I had to go back to that one. But it's true, isn't it? We're in a healthcare crisis for a reason. Uh, but anyway, I don't want to go into that. That was two weeks ago. Uh, but you know what I'm saying? It's when Satan switched his tactics, he did the same thing to the children of Israel just before they were entering the promised land. What did he do? Then he sent the Midianitish women into the camp to seduce the children of Israel away from their hope of crossing the Jordan and obtaining that promised land. Let me ask you the question, how many people do you think that the stake back in the 1500s took the lives of versus how many Christian lives are taken every day to, to, to pornography? Which is more effective killer of, of the soul? You see what I'm saying? Well, okay, and I've had this conversation before. 
half the population of the audience is, is women, and women say that is really gross, disgusting, and sick. Well, you've got to understand, romantic novels fit into the <coughs> same category as pornography. It's just built for a woman's mind. And no wonder in the book of Revelation, the last church on earth is the church of Laodicea that thinks everything is fine and okay and we're on our way to the kingdom, but what does the Bible say? <laughs> you poor people. <laughs> we are wretched, we're poor, we're blind, and we're naked. We have to have three things. What does it say? Uh, I think it's Revelation 3. No, it's not Revelation 3. Um, Revelation, uh, which chapter is it? The, the message to Laodicea. Somebody look, look it up. Is it three? What three things do the, do, does the angel counsel us to buy? Gold tried in the fire, I salve, and what else? One more thing. Has to do with the covering, I believe. And what? White clothes to cover. What is that white covering? It's the robe of Christ's righteousness, isn't it? We have to be covered by his righteousness. We have, the, have to have the gold tried in the fire. The character that has been tried by fire. And the eye salve. What does the eye salve do? Heals our eyesight. Gives us the ability to see our true condition. Doesn't it? And that's what Satan's been trying to do. He's blind us so that we don't see the particular sin of our age. And that is melting the common and the spiritual altogether so that we lose the ability to recognize as God's children, we have a high calling. Just something to think about. That's all that I had, but think about these things. Think about back in um, Numbers th chapter four. Think about why God did what he did. That whole chapter well, the first part of that whole chapter before verse 13 talks about those coverings. Go home, and go home and read those and see if you can understand what is being said there with everything being covered with a cloth of blue. That's your assignment. Let's close with prayer. Lord, most holy Father, Lord, I just ask that you would open all of our eyes to show us the way to just to surrender and submit our will to you. Lord, we know that time is short and we know there's no replay in this game of life that what we do now here today, we are, we are banking eterni eternity on. Lord, give us a desire to want to surrender everything in our life to come closer to you, to keep your laws, to keep your principles for what you've so mercifully given for us. You risked all of heaven to save us, and we are thankful, Lord, but in our own human way, we don't know how to be thankful enough, so we just ask you to come into our hearts and minds and fill us that from the inside, your Holy Spirit might return us back to you. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.